What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am joined today by the one, the only Clifford Blazinski. Am I pronouncing that correctly? More or less. All right, cool, cool. Formerly known as the great Cliffy B of uh, Epic Games back in the day. And and um, as somebody who grew up in the video game industry, I um, I started working at Rockstar Games, what, 2000 or something? So I've been around the industry for a long time. I was a creative director at Atari. I own my video game company now. So like I've been around this industry for a long time. And yeah, for those of you who don't know, and by the way, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Mark. Mark, yeah. uh, he did the whole like sly about five minutes before the uh, the podcast emailed me his CV. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> right. this, this guy's been around. He's done some stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've been around. But like for the people that don't know, uh, with E3, um, there was an E3 that started up, you know, back in Atlanta, I think was the first one that it moved yep. to Vegas. But when E3 was in its golden days, right? Like I'm talking like 2000 to like 2005. Oh, it was awesome. You were the you were the guy though. It was you, Jay Allard, Jay Allard, you, right? It would like go back and forth between. Oh yeah, I mean it's the, it's it was this was the a lot of gamers right now feel a little bit jaded. The ones that I think are in their mid to late 30s. Uh, because they came up kind of, you know, PS2 and in their their childhoods, you know, they had, you know, Pokemon and things like that. And now what you've seen, and this is this could be an entire uh, TED talk, you know, the, the rising cost of making AAA <laughs> games and, and gamers are getting kind of tired of the loot boxes and tired of the nickel and diming. And they kind of see that era as for them, the golden era of, you know, uh, you know, all the way from, you know, PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3 from, you know, Xbox to Xbox uh uh, 360 and you know ever since you know the later consoles there's been a little bit of skepticism amongst the uh the the fans of AAA gaming feeling like and even ubisoft i've saw, i sent an article around they're kind of complaining about the current state of AAA, and you know the risk involved in making a AAA experience uh, the amount of money involved it's mind-boggling these days like it's a miracle that we even have AAA games to play it's, yeah it's, great, I, I, it's crazy you know back in our uh sort of heyday right when i was at rockstar and you were lead designer at epic you know, like if you didn't sell a million units, you were a disaster. You know? Oh yeah, and I mean, even now that the, there's still some 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 BS going on in that area because uh, you know I I didn't play it, but I heard good things about the game Days Gone, and I saw some kerfuffle about it. That's right, I use that word kerfuffle. Um, <laughs> it's almost as useful as malarkey. Um, showing my age there, get off my damn lawn. <laughs> right, right. And uh, you know, some of the developers, I guess, were complaining that you know it sold six plus million copies, and they were like, "Ah, it's a bomb." And I'm like, "Dude, like, dude, that's first of all, that's a hit." Uh, you know, like I own a um, a VR development studio now, and oh, cool. Um, and right now my KPI for success is to get to 500 daily active users. Yeah. You, you know, like, like that's literally for me a, you know, like a score, you know, and like, well, the, the other problem is what happened and for better or for worse, uh, is, you know, you look at the rise of, uh, social media, Twitch streamers, YouTubers, TikTok, and things like that. And now we're at the point where the only thing anybody cares about is the popularity contest of how many people are playing something, you know, is it, and, and that's the meme that's been going around for mm -hmm. some time now where, you know, like you look at Fall Guys, which still has a strong user base, but mm -hmm. anytime they post an update, you know, there's always somebody trying to be, you know, the new version of first post is saying dead game, dead game, dead game. <laughs> right, right, right. And it's it's like everything, you know, you look at high school and the archetypes that happen and that, that archetype continues through, you know, what do they say about Hollywood? It's high school with money. What do they say about prison? It's high school with violence. You know, everything is, it's, right. it's, it's like back in the day, it was like, it's die hard on a boat. It's die hard on, on an Ebu, right? It's sure. this on that. And it's like, everything goes back to those, those human archetypes uh, of, of, of people wanting to be in groups and wanting to be a part of a club. And, and that's what a lot of it comes down to. It's like, you know, you, you, you play apex legends, you know, we're over here with overwatch and like that kind of back and forth. And it's this nasty tribal nature of humanity. And it's, yeah. it's like the nastiness in the console wars has, has subsided a little bit lately due to like, you know, Phil's people like Phil Spencer and whatnot, but it's still, it's still freaking ugly out there. By the way, Mark, can I swear? You can swear all you want, man. This is a totally open, you know, unfiltered, un, un, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, because there, there's, open, there, there's two me's with that. There's the normal me who's like, "What the fuck," and then there's like, "Oh my god, my my nine year old niece is running around the house. Don't say yeah, change the, the the kicker about swearing is though when you have smart nieces and nephews, is they mm. know when you were about to say something. The other one of the nieces just turned twelve. And we were visiting in New Orleans for the holidays, and I was like, "What the." The heck is going on here? And she, again, she just turned 12. She was 11 at the time. She turned to me and she goes, Uncle Cliffy, you were going to say a bad word. And I'm like, maybe. Right. So, kids, so, are, kids, so, kids are fucking smart, man. Yeah, yeah. Very anyway. smart. 
Um, so yeah, what one of the things that I learned early on in life, it was like this, you know, little sort of cliche little thing. Um, and um, it was from my, you know, my grandfather took me to buy a Sega Master System at Toys R Us, and it was like the happiest day of my life. And and I and like I had a choice between the Sega Master System and the Nintendo, you know, like entertainment system. Sophie's and, choice, you know, and like he was like. Like I kept going back and forth and he told me something I'll never forget. He's like, it's not about either or, it's about both and. And, you know, he told me this in Spanish, but I, um, he, he got me both, you know? So then like, I felt like I was the today kid. I learned your, today I learned your grandfather had many threesomes back in the day. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, I was the lucky kid on the block that had the Nintendo, the Sega, and the Commodore, right? So, like, oh, I had you probably have laser rest. tag and photon <laughs> while you're at it. Like, <laughs> right. the G.I. Joe and He Man, you were that little fucker with the fucking right. G.I. Joe right. carrier, weren't you? Right. Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, so, look, um, one thing that I want to ask you about uh, before we start going back to the past, because I definitely want to touch on some things, um, you know, is what's your kind of vibe on the state of the game industry right now in terms of you professionally? Are you still involved? You know, like I know you have your, you know, um, you know, your book, Control Freak, where you're sort of Oops. putting all those memoirs down on the line. Um, but in terms of creating content, are you still out there or is that an ambition that you still have? Or what what's what what's your state with that? Well, I mean, I'm not dead yet. Sure, so sure. That. Um uh the thing is is um I'm I'm still making stuff. Uh, you know, I've been pretty public about you know the the dog project that I've been working on. I've mm -hmm. I've kind of teased the fact that it's looking like uh, it's going to be a comic book. Um, you know, we're, issue one is done. We're still figuring out where it's going to go, what's going to happen with it, and uh, I'm really, really, really excited about that project. And the thing is, is I believe that back god you know see you've been in the business a while um you mm -hmm. know you remember when transmedia was all the rage oh my god the idea that you know okay we're gonna make a video game and then we're gonna make a movie to go along with it then we're gonna do action figures we're gonna yeah. have a netflix series we're gonna have args you probably yeah. remember that uh the second screen experience you know <laughs> right, all that right, bullshit, right. right but i think there's merit to it like when the thing is is you know on sunday you know it's there's not a lot of tv apart from professional sports, you know, I'm a Saints fan. My wife's from New Orleans, you know, so I'll show up on any given Sunday to watch them choke. Um, but right, right. I'm a Dolphin is, fan, so, yeah. you know. But yeah. when they win, it's so good. <laughs> right, right. And uh, the, the, the kicker is, is uh, where's it going? Oh, yeah, on Sunday at 9 o'clock, my butt was sitting downstairs to watch The Last of Us because, you know, sure. I looked at, you know, uh, they had Neil involved from, from Naughty Dog. They had, uh, you know, the guy who did Chernobyl, which was a great miniseries in HBO. Amazing. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there watching the hour went by like that. The adaptation was perfect. And uh, this is what happens when you start with great source material. Mm. And, you know, I don't think I don't think the developers at Naughty Dog set out and said, we're going to make The Last of Us a transmedia IP. They said, we're going to make a cinematic, heartfelt, uh, post-apocalyptic story about one of the last original takes on the zombie apocalypse, which is sure. the, fun the fungal take, which is utterly terrifying and real. Um, I, you know, those of us who've done the research about how it takes over, like there's like the right, wasp, right. the wasp one, they're, 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 the zombies exist in nature. That's the scariest part. And, uh, and it was really, really good because they started with great source material. They didn't do it all at once. And I believe, you know, for my 25 years of video game experience, what I'm doing these days, uh, is I'm just creating IP that could be mm. comic books. That could be a Netflix series. It could be a video game. It could be, uh, an, you know, action figures, anything in between. And because of my, my game experience, you know, for instance, the dog thing, being made as an IP as a comic book, you know, I'm deliberately putting in verbs, uh, actions and things and objectives and things for this dog to do in the world, mm. apart from having a cool narrative, a story of where the dog come from and what the dog's doing uh, in order to make it easily adaptable into a game. And I think, you know, uh, the folks that made uh, Batman, you know, they they kind of they didn't really video games weren't even around when Batman first came about. And there's been some bad Batman video games. But, in, you know, Rocksteady cracked the code when they, sure. they made Arkham Asylum, you know, where Batman has, you know, he can kick people's asses. He has all these devices. He has all those cool vehicles. Uh, and he's a detective. You know, if I from my experience, that was the first Batman game that actually had yeah. acknowledged the fact that Batman is the, the world's greatest detective. Right. Data East had a couple of good Batman games back in the old days, back on the Commodore. And yeah, the side scroller. Right. That was back yeah. in the day. The screenshots next to it, like the Atari yeah, ST, yeah, yeah, Commodore yeah. version, the yeah, yeah, version. Yeah, yeah. that was right around the time of the Michael Keaton movies, which still, for the record, hold up. Um, yeah, and so, uh, but the th but yeah, so the, my my goal is to make. I'm just I'll be over here in my corner making IP, and you know I'm funding the uh, the majority of it myself, uh, and mm. it's really really nice to work with other creative people 
and make stuff without, you know, some no offense to producers, like a good producer ships games like Rod Ferguson on the Gears franchise. And, you know, you, you probably know from your experience in the video game business, a bad producer can also sink a project. So uh, I don't have, but I don't have anybody in my ear saying you can do that. You can, you, you can do that. You can't do that. I can make whatever I want right now. And if somebody wants to talk to me, I'm all ears right now. But in the meantime, you know, I'll be hanging out, playing video games, working on my new IPs and reading books. Awesome. What, what are you playing out of curiosity? Uh, I just started Stray last night. Uh, okay. you know, because I'm making an IP about a dog, you know, then I sure. maybe, you know, play, you know, something about a cat. It's really, really promising, really cool. Uh, uh the game had me, there's a couple moments early in the game where first off uh, there's a keyboard terminal and I'm playing the cat and I walk over the keys and just put complete gibberish on the screen. And I'm like, yep, cat moment, number one. And then right. cat moment, number two, there's a bag that's empty. And I find the bag and I use the bag and the, the bag winds up stuck on my cat's head. And then they invert the controls. So the, the cat's running around all screwed up. And, you know, I, I came for a cat experience, I'm getting a really, really cool kind of post-apocalyptic cyberpunk city, uh, unraveling the mystery of what happened. But you know, you, <laughs> I'm sitting cool. there like I'm needing, I'm needing a carpet, and then uh, you know, 15 minutes later, there's a curtain that I have to kind of open by doing the kneading motion. You know, the tutorial was kneading the carpet. Just brilliant, tiny little design moments like that. Um, also, uh, what else am I playing? Uh, I was playing my Switch really, really hardcore. Mm. Um, just die hard. Uh, you know, I love Celeste on my Switch. Uh, right now, I'm actually playing this game called Cleopatra Fortune. It's mm. an old, I think, 90s like Tetris kind of knockoff, kind of like oh, Columns, that game Columns. And it's a stupid little uh, you know Tetris-type game, but for some reason, I find it utterly compelling. And uh, then also, I'm playing on Norco, which is this really, really cool kind of 2D, uh, old-school uh, text, not, not text, a graphical adventure where I'm, you know, it's oh, kind, of, it's kind of like the games I did way back in the day when I started, right, off, right, right. started off making games. So I just got finally went to rehab for vampire survivors. Um, okay. That was a rough, that was a rough, <laughs> that was a rough 30 days. Sa Sandra Bullock was there. Um, you know, we, we commiserated over the 20, the 28 days of being in rehab because that game, you know, so I, I was talking about bullet hell because, uh, Ikaruga came up in conversation recently. The the I think it was uh, Treasure. I can't maybe it was Treasure. I can't remember who mm. made it. It was the top down bullet hell uh, Japanese game where you were the ship, and depending on your polarity, you're black or you're white. The bullets would either give you power or kill you, and you could switch polarization to black or white, yin or yang. And I always thought that mechanic was brilliant, and so I mm. fired that one up recently. And I said on Twitter, it's like I want a good bullet hell experience. And somebody's like Vampire Survivors. So I was like, what? And I looked up the video of it. I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, the the characters are all crude pixel art, this big. You just use a left stick or WASD and you just walk around and you just kill stuff and get power ups and repeat. And for some reason that game is like heroin. It is, it is yeah. so simple in that game, but games like that give me hope in this, this triple A space where everything is so confused right now. Right. 1000%. I, I was very, very lucky, um, you know, because of my days at rockstar and stuff like that. I, I, I was very close with Mike Wilson, who you might know. Oh yeah. Good old Mike. Yeah. And uh, Mike um, embedded me with these kids from Sweden that were working on this game called Hotline Miami. Oh um, God, I love that. And, and like, I made this full documentary on it. And, and like these these two kids working on some like random thirty dollar game engine that you buy on Steam, created this absolute masterpiece. To your point, like not a ton of crazy production design, but incredible creativity and incredible game design. Right. So I'm gonna, I'm, like, I'm, I'm gonna look that uh, documentary up. That actually sounds really interesting. Oh but yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'll send you the link to it. Please, please. There, there was a famous quote a while back from some executive. I can't remember if it was Gates or Balmer or somebody. And they were asking them, like, where do you think your competition is? You know, and, and the, the question is, oh, it's always going to be some other big corporation. And the quote, I, I wish I could dig it up. It's 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 going to be the two people in a garage in, in Boise, you mm -hmm. know, who have their modding uh, some popular game. They're modding Arma. You know, to make you know player unknowns battlegrounds, they're modifying sure. World of Warcraft three in order to make the first MOBA. They're modifying right, right. you know Half Life to make Counter Strike. You know, my wife still plays Counter Strike to this day. There's Counter Strike still has an incredibly big community online because it's the most airtight first person shooter ever made. So mm. I love the fact that we still have little games like Fall Guys that can come out and you know proof that you know we should have learned our lesson with Minecraft. You know, Minecraft had such simple graphics, but it ultimately wound up to uh, adding to the charm and the experience of the game. And Microsoft, you know, you know, bought that up and they've done a fantastic job of just expanding that experience. So graphics are great. I always say people come for the graphics, but they stay for the gameplay. And that will always, always be true. Yeah. So kind of hopping all over the place here, but you know, there's one thing about your career that's kind of stuck with me for, you know, to this day, and I see it as an inflection point, and I'm sure that there's many that I could, you know, dig up about you and your career and Epic and all those things. But for me, 
it was that first commercial for Gears of War that, and maybe this wasn't the first commercial, but it's the first commercial that I was like, okay, there's something happening with video games and media. And it was a commercial that 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 was using some adaptation of the Tears for Fears yeah, uh, song, Mad World. Mad World. And um, to me, that was like a moment where video games kind of became a little bit different, you know? And it was a commercial for the first Gears of War. I believe the game hadn't even come out yet, right? When 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 this commercial was first introduced, and it was like yeah. these beautiful, crazy action scenes juxtaposed with this incredibly sort of pensive song. I and my entire life, I'm like, that's 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 Cliffy B in a nutshell. Was that you, or did you have like nothing to do with that? Like, I, no, I mean, it, ask I, you that. I, I, it did, but the thing was, it wasn't deliberate, you know. And mm. you can read read about it in the book. Okay, great. Yeah. Control free. It's not so subtle. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that I, you know, was going through a rough patch in my personal life. You know, I was pretty much broke at that point. Mm. You know, my first marriage had been crumbling. And then I was just uh, incredibly depressed. Uh, you know, I was working on this, what I would become a huge, huge title and huge IP. And um, I, but I was sad. And, mm. uh, you know, I was driving before I decided to leave the, my, my first wife. Um, I was driving home from a, a long day at Epic and uh, I was listening to NPR and they were playing these kind of Celtic slash Irish songs. And this uh, artist came on named Karen Casey and she had the song called One I Love. Uh, which if you look it up, it's incredibly haunting, but beautiful. And I thought about, wouldn't it be interesting to contrast, you know, scenes of a war-torn environment with beautiful, sad music like that? And I, I never really said it to that many people, but somehow the ad agency and Microsoft had picked up upon that vibe through mm. the game and through, I guess, myself and the way that I, I interacted with them. And they sat us down and for a meeting and they suggested, you know, doing this cool trailer where, you know, Marcus is being chased by Locust through these beautiful ruins and that, you know, play that melancholy song, which is incredibly sad when you, when you think about it. And, sure, and that, yeah, yeah. But that, that was, I think in some ways, video games first, one of the first uh, salvos that kind of said, Hey, you know, maybe there's, you know, yeah, there's a, a chainsaw gun. Yeah. There's dudes yelling, fuck yeah. And all that stuff, but there's, there's more to it. You know, like mm. my wife, my wife's uh, live stream. Uh, she, she did a, a playthrough of gears too with her best friend uh, that she grew up with. And, you know the Maria scene where Mar, uh, where Dom, Mark, and Marcus and Dom wind up in the hollow. Dom finds his wife Maria, who's been missing for some time, and just been turned into you know she's catatonic. She's basically brain dead. She's you know a vegetable, and you know there, there's no way they could bring the, her, her bring her out of the hollow. There's no way they could save her and, and put her back to her normal self. So you know Dom makes the executive decision. He has to put down his own fucking wife, and I mean it's mm. a really well done scene. It's incredibly you know hard to watch and every comment on youtube is i can't believe that how rough this is this you know totally brought me to tears this this is one of the moments where i feel, felt like video games you know much like the grinch's heart you know grew up or grew two sizes a little bit that day mm. and you know video games have the power to make you feel things they always have they always sure. will it's just a matter of what the creator is trying to get across and uh it's it, I, the franchise for me always had those kinds of cool moments it was it was heart with brutality, which, you know, for me, I guess, and I've said this in interviews before, but, you know, like mm. I can appreciate it, you know, good football or a good MMA event, but also love going to musicals. You know, I think it's important, especially for dudes to be able to, you know, yeah. appre appreciate both as opposed to just always be, always be kicking ass and drinking Brondo. First of all, I think you might be um, the sort of North Carolina version of me because that's pretty much my life. I, uh, I, uh, you know, the one thing that I miss about living in New York City is going to the musicals, you know. Yeah. I um, I was very lucky to work on that show, you know, Dexter and Michael C. Hall, the uh, lead, uh, you know, actor on the hey, show. He's from is here. Also, right, right. He's actually from Cary, North Carolina. That's right. Yep. Um, he's also big into the musicals, right? He's an incredible singer and did Hedwig and the Angry Inch. I saw that oh, five that. times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did Hedwig. Um, you know, I actually dated, you know, the girl who plays the guy, you know, in that, you know, like in that show. Um, but yeah, man, that that's that's really fun because I, I I've always thought that video games are more akin to kind of books than they are to movies, you know. And you, you, you've heard you've heard that as well, yeah. Like uh, my old buddy uh, Josh Ortega, the uh, the brilliant but slightly crazy writer who did a. Uh, a lot of he wrote gears too and he did a lot of heavy lifting mm. in the comics and things like that um really really brilliant talented guy he said you know the video games are a lot like novels and the fact that you know if you're watching a tv show or a movie and you walk out the room to go pee it keeps going you know unless you right. pause it right but you know when you stop reading a, a novel or a book uh, whatever like it, it just stops immediately it requires your 
rapt attention at every beat at every given moment. And it's the same thing with the majority of video games. You know, you have to be engaged and, you know, it's the whole lean forward versus lean back experience. Sure. And, and, but that's the power of interactivity. You know, when you're, you're, you're playing as these characters and something happens or somebody dies, you know, you are really, really invested in that. That has a, a, the potential for a huge emotional impact. So, so as somebody who's got that sort of dramaturgy vibe, who, um, you know, um, has written his own book, you know, kind of like a Renaissance man, I'm, I got to tell you, I'm a little bit surprised that you haven't dug into the whole VR thing, you know, especially where, because the bar for like, if I wanted to make a games company right now and I'm competing with all the flat screeners, I have a lot of competition. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. First of all, if you're up for it, you got to come check out my game. I I'm, I'd love I'm build, to. I'm building one right now, uh, sort of massively multiplayer RPG UGC game, all built on Unreal. Um, but anyway, um, I do notice that you have one VR credit that I can see here, which is Trevor Saves the Universe, which is an absolutely incredible game. Did you actually get involved with that, or are you just buddies with the guys who made it? What's your story? Oh, it, it, to that? I mean, it's both. Um, uh, you know, there's been some recent uh, you know news in regards to Justin Roiland. He's a friend of mine. He's had you know uh, some allegations and things like that. So okay, since I haven't heard any of them. Just full. It's disclosure. it's a whole situation. Um, so he, since he's a good friend, I'm just going to put that over there and focus on the games. Fair um, enough. So the thing is, is, uh, you know, uh, I'm friends with a lot of the de developers over there. Um, you know, I gave them advice when they started their own studio as somebody who started his own game studio that ultimately didn't work out. Well, I've, I've um, been there and I'm there right now, my uh, friend. Dude, the, internet thought it was, <laughs> the internet thought it was one big funny thing. It's like, great. Yeah. 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 Call me next time you try and start your own game studio, guys. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I gave them advice on like what to do, what to look for, what not to, made some introductions, you know, played the game. Um, and you know, it, it, it was a cool little game. Uh, there, the follow up high on life is actually really, really good. And it's a uh, shooter, it's, right? Like the, the yeah, FPS. Yeah, yeah, it's a shooter where the, the features, the guns are, are all talk shit the whole time, but it's actually has really, really solid shooting mechanics. Uh, really, really hilarious and crazy dialogue. It's that kind of sense of comedy. You either get it or you don't. Mm. It's kind of like British comedy. Like I was never that big on British comedy apart from Monty Python, uh, watching right. like, you know, Faulty Towers and things like that. I'm like, I just, I don't get it. Right. Um, and so it's either your thing or it's not. But the thing is, it's polarizing. So if you go to YouTube, like the amount of, you know, think pieces on, on High on Life is tremendous. But the VR thing, um, I could take up an entire hour talking about VR because I love oh, VR. Oh, man, I'm... I, I'm all about it. I'm all about it. I'd love to hear your take on it. Mark, we're we're old enough to remember Dactyl Nightmare at a game works, okay? <laughs> right. yeah, these these headsets that were like the size of a fucking sure. yeah, yeah. Ford, Ford probe like on your fucking head. Um, and the graphics were just worse than potato quality and the frame rate. All of it was just terrible. Uh, but the thing is this uh, you know, VR was starting to have a resurgence, you know. Uh, full disclosure, uh, I was at Epic Games headquarters. Uh, years ago, I saw the cobbled together duct taped version of Oculus and I said I want in uh, and I was mm. able to invest in it. Uh, and then, like, oh, wow. uh, and, and, congratulations. And they, yeah, the best investment of my entire life. Um, and then, you know, uh, Zuckerberg came along, bought them for a ton of money. Uh, so, you know, I, I did well off of that. But uh, there, I still, I think Beat Saber is good. I think there's a lot of really, really good games on VR. I still, I'm sorry, I don't see a killer app. I think VR mm. chat's fun for what it does. It, it is, you know, it pops up, you know, every day on my Reddit feed. Um, and I just, I, I don't think there's a world of Warcraft for VR yet. You know, I think we're a long ways away from Oasis. Uh, I think that's the goal from what my impression of, you know, the title of the podcast and everything is, you know, it sounds like you're trying to gun for the metaverse. Like a lot of people are, um, but just, it had, you know, make a compelling experience first that, that works the best in VR, you know, a lot of the VR games are either the ones right now where I, get, I have to get sweaty in it. I'm sorry. I don't want to get sweaty in VR. I'll go mm -hmm. work out. Like I, you know, I don't need a, a headset to, to, to get sweaty. Um, or they're, you know, they're like stationary kind of like, you know, like you're playing Galaga in, in VR, like, great. Mm. Okay. That's, there's things coming at me. That's cool. Like, give me a shared social experience. Give me something that I can't get anywhere else. Uh, that's compelling. And mm. I just, I haven't seen it yet. And, and part of the problem, and I'm going to, I've said it before in other interviews is, you know, when I had my studio, we were looking for three to $5 million, which in the video game space is not a lot of fucking money. Uh, mm -hmm. especially when you're going to your Sony's and the people that the platform holders that are, you know, providing these platforms. And, the, you know, if you want VR to be a thing, the people who own the platform have to eat it. 
and 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 have you know lost leaders that make the VR platform viable. Mm. Kids kids love it. You know, we've given it to all our nieces and nephews, and they're just running around the house bumping into shit, having a blast. Um, <laughs> you know, kids are fearless, but you know, to put right, that right. He- to put that headset in a grown ass adult must require you know the juice must be worth the squeeze. So it needs to be a, a pretty compelling experience. Um, yeah. And I just don't think the budgets have been there yet, and it's it still has been kind of you know lagging along. I you know. It, it, it's like going scuba diving. You know, you better see some cool shit. I better see at least a manta ray and a fucking turtle if I'm going to put on that goddamn, you know, uh, regulator and everything. Right, right. First of all, that's a very interesting take. And, and I, I gravitate towards the one, uh, those two words that you use, a shared social experience. You think, as I think, because this is exactly what my, you know, experiment is all about. And like, look, I've been very lucky. I've sold two media companies. I was in the video game industry, long story short, uh, Rockstar Games got too big for my head, went to, uh, you know, started my own games company. I was like, I'm going to make mobile games. That flopped, became creative director at Atari, um, then um, started my other game company. So it's for me, it's been like this like loop of trying to make video game companies and failing, always making media companies and succeeding, right? I've sold two media companies. I have yet to make a hit since 2001 it would like like when it comes to video games getting up was pretty good i did a graffiti game once that was pretty yeah, it's the, the mark echo one yeah yeah so mark echo was my partner um in both in getting up and then in complex media and then collider and all of my media ventures um and man the video game industry is friggin tough you it's know? The, because the rules change every three years right right and like right now i'm so sort of happy that i'm in the vr space because the the bar is not very high and, and and like i know that sounds sounds a little bit defeatist but i love the idea that it, it's the closest thing that you can get to being back a young clifford blazinski writing his own game in visual basic like like really being able to experiment and having a few hundred people really love your game as some measure of success, right? Yeah, but I mean, like, it's still it's still the wild, wild west, and you're the right, one who's, right. who's you know you're the you're the frontiersman who's you know putting the the you know the little town out there in the frontier, you know, and you're the yeah. sheriff, you're the sheriff, and what goes in your town goes in your town. I got two guns, one for each of you. <laughs> right, right, but yeah, look, I I totally agree with you. I think, ironically, I think the best VR games that I've played are really bad ports of flat screen games, right? Like. Hitman 3, I don't know if you've ever played Hitman 3, but Hitman 3 in VR is absolutely horrible. But if you can get past all of the bad paradigm in terms of them adapting it into a VR context, it is an absolute masterpiece. Like, really? it's just... It is well, so, I mean, I don't know if, if that's the case, then, you know, I, I love things that, you know, try something, fail, but then have, have nuggets of, of oh my coolness God, to them. So if somebody could take what works... In that, I mean, a VR Hitman experience sounds pretty compelling, you know. And oh, and, it's, and it's incredible. Take the things that that you know that works with that. Make your own version of Hitman. You know, call it Assassin or whatever. Like depending on Assassin's Creed and trademark, but whatever. <laughs> call it, you know, uh, you know, uh, the Cleaner. You know, Harvey Keitel in, in fucking Pulp Fiction. Right. You know, make make that. You know, and and so take some of those spiritual elements and then make your own version of it. You know, I, I guess they they did put a version of Resident Evil Four in vr but i just I, I played through that game it thoroughly inspired me i loved it but i'm like i'm okay not playing it on vr now like just right give, right give me an yeah, original, that's like a game cube. yeah you know that that's like a gamecube thing right like it was all about that little gamecube resident evil 4 it's like vr like where's the where's the madden you know like there's this little company that made this game called nfl pro era that's like it's not good at all but it put but it was the first one to get the nfl brand on it and it's like the top selling game on the Oculus. Um, and it's not very good. It's like, why is there such hesitancy from the big boys to come in there and make a game? Supposedly Ubisoft is making some Assassin's Creed thing or something. But, you know, to your point, VR it's an, emer- it's an emerging market. Emerging market right. is scary. But VR chat seems to be the one that has some traction. Right. And, and to put that one into context, it only does about 30,000 daily active users. Okay. You know, like if you were to tell Epic, hey, Fortnite's down to 30,000 daily active users. And yeah, they jump out a window. <laughs> right. But in the VR context, it's worth $4 billion, you know? But, so it's like. But that's the thing. It's like it, it, once you can get that, it's like 
once you can get that initial kernel of a user base, right? Mm. You know, I'm going to go back because, you know, before we, we went live, you know, I was, I was complimenting your, your guitar collection behind you and you, mm. you were mentioning, you're like, yeah, I'm in a band and I have some stuff on Spotify. And you, but you were dismissive of it. You're like, oh, it's kind of a hobby and things like that. And I'm like, do it, dude. Just fucking go for it. And like, for, I yeah. guess and I was equating like what you do with that to me in karaoke. Mm. And it's one of those things like I, you know, I co-own the Raleigh Beer Garden in downtown every Monday at eight o'clock. You know, uh, we do karaoke for a few hours and, you know, we get, we get a, some nights we have like 10 people and other nights we have like 50 or more. Right. Mm. And the the thing is, is what's happened there is we, we have a a bunch of regulars that show up that I, you know, I've kind of gotten to know and they get to know this with the bar staff and you start off, it's rolling the snowball downhill. You get that sense of community. Once right. you have a, that core community, they tell a friend, a friend tells a friend, and then it becomes this thing. And, you know, it's it's virality before virality was a thing. Uh, you know, again, going back to the tribal nature of humanity. So if you can get that core, you know, snowball of X users, whatever that may be. So whenever you log in at any given time, there's a handful of people that you may or may not know or may, may want to sure. meet. Then, you know, you're good. So that could be, you know, 30,000 concurrent or it could be, you know, a million, but whatever, whatever. Right. Uh, but the bottom line is you just you need that 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 community in order to get things rolling. And in and, and VR, I just. I'm I'm open to anybody's suggestions right now. I got two headsets sitting right here collecting dust because you know I. Oh, I've, that's I've, I've that hurts in, me, Clifford. That hurts me. I've played and enjoyed. You know, once every six months, I sit down. And we literally have a VR room back here. Like we had the the fancy ass like kitchen t- uh, dining room table we got rid of. Like this is our designated VR space, and you know we just we don't we're not using it that much. And I I love it. You know I believe in it. Uh, you know Oculus uh, Quest Three is apparently coming out soon. I'm sorry mm-hmm. they got rid of the name Oculus. It's now just Quest. Meta. Um, I think it's Meta now. Meta. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know I I still right. own some, I, 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 I still I still own some stock and I'll just keep watching it limp yeah. along. And I'm just like Zuck, get your head out of your ass, man. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you don't have to answer this one, but I'm dying to know if you could snap your fingers and sort of create high concept pitch for what kind of VR game you would like to make, what, what does that look like? I mean, it's uh, take, just look at what worked in world of Warcraft in a lot of ways, world of Warcraft felt like a fancy chat room, but what you're Mm -hmm. giving people is a shared social space. As I said earlier, and by the way, it's three words, not two words, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) But the the thing is, is, you know, uh, give me a a shared space where I, I can feel like I'm somebody else and I can, party up with other people and do interesting things and have a sense of reward and fulfillment and community. Right. Right. Um, and, you know, just, and a just, sense of role, right? Because I was this, a big this, Warcraft this is, player. This is fine for a while, but okay. Like that's a, that's a right. single, that's a single session experience and that's cool because, for what it is. But you know, is that going to, is that a system justifier? Is that one where, you know, you have to justify, you know, your, you know, parents who have two kids, you know, and with this economy, you know, with eggs being, you know, $4 a dozen, you know, can you justify yeah. spending X in a headset? Like, okay, put this on and you'll see that you need that moment. And then, you know, uh, sadly, the ideal experience would be like, yeah, my spouse doesn't talk to me anymore. They just sit there at that headset on playing with their friends all day long. Right. Yeah. Like that, that's what they, that's what people actually really want. And yeah, you know, as much as that would be a dystopian right. future, uh, that's where, you know, the, 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 the shareholders, the key holders in VR really need to, to start thinking in their headspace. If they, I'm sure some people are thinking about it. You know, I was talking to people that worked at, uh, on World of Warcraft at Blizzard. You know, like they said, you know, making that game nearly broke the studio. Like it, it nearly tore them apart. Now, right. you know, how many years later, it's still chugging along. You know, oh, it's, you could, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Because it, it, so much of that game, you know, is is just people. I remember working on, on Unreal and Unreal Tournament. You know, I was working on Unreal Tournament 2004. And I'm going out to pubs and I'm talking to people. They're like, what do you do? And I'm like, I make video games. Aren't I cool? They're like, I play WoW. And it just became that thing where, you know, it was one ring to rule them all. It was, wow, was the game. You play wow. I just, oh, I just 1, play wow. 1,000%. Yeah, exactly. 1, and that, and, and that VR needs that. And, you know, hopefully hopefully that's your game, dude. Do you have a name, by the way? So so right now, it's kind of working title. It is called Club Metaverse. And basically, okay. you know, my favorite book or one of my favorite books, I mean, that's such a, you know, whatever, is, is Snow Crash, right? So uh, in Snow Crash, the Black Sun was kind of like the epicenter of the metaverse. So <clears throat> Club Metaverse is really me being uh, sort of, you know, tipping the hat to the Black Sun. For a little while, it was called the Black Sun until I realized that it's like some Nazi, like, you know, like uh, thing, you know, like, 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 like somebody sort of hit me to what the Black Sun yeah, actually that was. Back in the day, our, our artists would just randomly put an 88 on characters because the skins were mirrored on the characters. And those are the, that was the number you could put. But then realizing that, like, somehow that turned, that was a Hail Hitler reference or something. <laughs> Right, I, I, don't right, fucking, right. I don't fucking like like unintentional but you know like um so basically what what my game is is a you know like it's a social mmo type of game where you create your own content um but the way that i sort of uh, um 
you know, package my SDK. My my engine is like a fork, quote unquote, of the Unreal Engine. And we have all of these package gameplay elements in the SDK that users can create content with. And one of them is a shooter. And the kind of uh, example map that I have is called Cyberdust, which is a takeoff of dust, right? Uh, and then for my PVE, uh, as, you know, like like module, it's called Holomance, which is a takeoff of Sholomance, which is one of the uh, you know famous uh, dungeons in World of Warcraft. Okay. So you can do all of that class-based co-op dungeon crawling, which I think was the magic of 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 WoW for me was that the healer had his own responsibilities, and he had to really embrace those and the tank had to embrace his role and yeah. the damage had to embrace their role and more importantly you guys all had to embrace your roles how of how you interact together right like yeah. the teamwork element of world of warcraft is i think what took it over the top um and yeah you know that's what i'm trying to do but then well, I so also so from the real quick from, from the user yeah, generation yeah. uh standpoint like are you gunning for like some roblox type vibe with that with users can make their own kind of experience and game experience yeah, so or so, so basically, I give you everything that VR chat gives you, right? Which is the ability to, to create whatever avatar you want, whatever map you want. All the I waifus. Also, all the waifus. Yeah, yeah. All of the furries, or you know, like or fuzzies. Uh, like it's either furries or fuzzies. I'm not sure, but it's one of the two. Um, and <clears throat> we also let you do items. Um, but yeah, you know. But for me, that barrier to enter is way too high, right? So it's like my big dream is like, you know, what does YouTube look like in video games? Yeah. And for you to be able to really get there, you have to lower the barrier to enter to like practically zero, right? That's what the iPhone did. That's what all of the sort of video editing tools did. That's what all this podcasting stuff did is that it lowered the production cost of, of publishing to zero basically, right? Yeah. So how does that work with games when, when the barrier is so high? So We've implemented a lot of AI assisted design. So, um, you know, we have all of the stable diffusion uh, stuff in the game. So there's like holodecks in the game where you like talk to them and then like the walls change to whatever it is that you say. So I'm able to graph textures onto 3D models. I'm able to create images from scratch that are fully replicated across the network so everybody sees them. I, I have yet to create real time three dimensional objects in the game, but there's a few uh, APIs that are out there that are trying to do that. One's called uh, Geppetto, one's called Pointy. There's a few people trying to do that, but yeah. I believe we're years away from being able to then say a sentence or form what they call a prompt and create some pretty interesting uh, UGC with AI assisted, you know, like assisted design. There's also something called Codex that allows you to use um, the open AI protocol to write code, the code is buggy as hell, but it does kind of work. I've um, I've I've seen some uh, dev friends of mine have shared like you know some some code uh, some AI generated code that's for them has actually worked decently and like and yeah yeah I yeah. mean you you look at you know the where it's where it's going from you know Chat GPT uh, and you know creation of code and you know somebody saying making me a screenplay whereas you know Lincoln and uh, didn't free the slaves. You're like, that's going to be, that, that sounds fun. Let's do that. Um, and then, you know, look at AI art, you know, like, and it's all coming together, right. Where, you know, people are going to be able to, well, it, it goes back to, you know, one of the many reasons why, you know, Epic games and my former employer, uh, is so successful is not only the great games that they would make, but also the tools that they would make. And, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. My old my old boss Tim Sweeney learned. I mean, I'm a I'm a creative, but you know, I I, I can't really draw. You know, I'm I'm a crappy coder, but I, I have ideas. And uh, mm -hmm. you know what happened was Tim would send me like you know the Unreal Editor, the early versions of it. And what he did was he made it you know easier for people like myself who had some cool ideas and, and things that I wanted wow. to make, but I, but I didn't have the technical skill to learn 3D Studio Max or or any number. So of like the, you uh, were like his muse for that in a way, or like what was, was his? Yeah, I mean, well, it started with Jazz Jackrabbit going back in the day, where he gave yeah. me you know the editor that the Dutch programmer RDM Brisset had made, and that that allowed me to kind of import my own art that I made, and then you know do my little animations and my and add sound effects and tag it, you know, empower the creatives. And mm. if you you know that's one thing you know I remember watching. It was years ago. I was at my brother's house watching my niece and nephew play Roblox, and it looked like the dumbest shit I'd ever seen. Uh, the, the graphics made Minecraft look like you know Assassin's Creed, and you know <laughs> there's like these two these two clunky characters that were just they were just trying to get to the top 
of this this hill before a flood came and then just repeat it over and over again and they just thought it was the funniest shit and i sat there at the time thinking i'm working my ass off day in and day out making these triple a games and this is what the kids are, are eating up right. right now but at the same time i think back to when i was like eight or nine years old and if i had a platform where i could have you know played other people's games or made my own games and contributed to it it would have felt like one big party going on that i wanted to be a part of so you know more power to them uh, right. i just I, I i think you know you know it goes back to that that garage argument that i was using at the start of the podcast you know like you know what what's wrong with empowering the two kids you know and they're in their parents garage to exactly create, the next, create you, the next big thing first of all you just bring up a fascinating uh point that just kind of blew my mind there for a second which is um as a game designer with all of these ambitions people typically tend to go the quentin tarantino route which is like i want to make a game that i want to play versus the idea of making a game as an adult, making a game specifically for kids. Um, Cause like, if you look at Roblox, um, I think that's doing like 50 million daily active users, like something yeah, disgusting it's huge. like that. So it's like, as a designer, what kind of headspace do you have to sort of be honest with about who you're making the game for? And how do you approach that question? Like, who's well, this game? Well, I mean, for? you, you can put game developers and creator creatives in different types of buckets. There's the the you know the bright eyed and bushy tailed ones that are younger and they're making stuff they just because they think it's cool. Uh, there's the ones that have some experience but they're still making stuff they think they're, they're cool. They kind of hit like late twenties, early thirties, um, and then often you know there's the developers that wind up having kids and they wind up you know kind of coming at it from this angle of like, okay, you know, I, I'm you know i'm speaking as a developer you know i'm a developer uh you know i'm in my 30s you know i have a couple kids you know we had when i was like 30 or so now they're like four and five six seven whatever they're playing what you know this game they just won't stop and so what happens with a lot of developers is they they try to make a game that you know to to make their kids play to see if the kids mm, will actually will actually like it for a while it was so many game developers were usually male and then it was like oh, i just want to make my my wife be able to play a game and it's like dude like the, you should, the not in a game, it's not in a game, it's fine. Um, <laughs> and so the thing is, just like, what you need to do is tap down into that Peter Pan syndrome that, you know, what, what did you find compelling as a child? Like, one of those feelings that I had, you know, as a child growing up in the suburbs of Boston was, you know, in spring and summer, I would try and, you know, catch frogs and snakes and and, and lizards and whatnot. And I, I just, I go to the pond or I go to the field, I'd lift up the old tires that somebody had left in the middle of the field. I'd see what kind of snakes I could catch. I, I had the little guide, which so I, I knew which ones are poisonous and whatnot. I mean, it's not that different than catching Pokemon. Right. right. And something, you know, who, whomever were the main creatives behind Pokemon were just genius because it, it gave you, you know, the pet vibe where every kid wants to have a pet dog or a pet cat. It gave you the catching vibe where, you know, you'd be the kid out in the woods catching the turtles, the frogs, and then have the battle vibe uh, all tied tied up ni nicely with this kind of JRPG type vibe. You know, next thing you know, cultural phenomenon. And that all came from tapping into the, those childhood experiences. I mean, what were the games we play, you know, on the playground, you know, uh, capture the flag, you know, dodgeball. Right. right. Uh, Cops you know, and robbers. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But when when you when you uh, created Gears of War, that was a game for you at that point in your life, though, right? Because the game industry, I think, supported that sort of adult leaning. And look, we got to take some credit over at Rockstar for that. You know, with with GTA Three was really kind of exploded because I remember being at E Three and looking around and saying, "Okay, there's Metal Gear Solid Two, there's Devil May Cry Two. If we come in third place, we're in a really really good spot." You know, yeah. and like we, we blow those those two away and then mature gaming became a thing. And, you know, that when you did Gears, was that definitely for you at that age as a, you know, mid 20 year old? Dude. Uh, late 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 twenties, but I mean, you know, be growing up with GI Joe Transformers, uh, you know, and then later in my twenties watching Band of Brothers and uh, you know, saving private Ryan, things like that. I wanted to make something that just felt cool. You know, yeah. something that just, you know, felt, you know, badass, right? Like, and this, right. remember, we're also dealing with the era of, you know, like uh, magazines like Stuff and Maxim NES Complex, um, right. where it's like, hey, right. here's, the, here's the new Zune that you're going to want, right? Things like that. Um, and it was very, very bro-ish, but I still wanted, again, to, for it to have its heart. So, you know, I was making the kind of game that I wanted to fucking play, and I wanted gamers to play it. I think mm. you have to find that balance. You did a great though, like, job at that, Clifford. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I just, I always, I, I got into games because I wanted to make great games. I wanted to be well known for it and I wanted to make money. If, if you lean too more, too much towards the wanting to make money vibe, like, you know, you, sometimes you can lose the heart. So I fi think finding that balance of, the, of those elements of making a great game and also wanting to make money, it, it goes back to, you know, if you build it, they will come. Mm. And, you know, the thing is, is, you know, they worked on 
Fortnite for years when they were working on their kind of plans versus zombies, save the the planet, save the world mode. And, uh, you know, it did okay for them, right? And then once once they pivoted and made a PUBG style mode, boom, you know, global phenomenon. And, sure. you know, it goes back to, you know, uh, uh, the, the team at Rovio made Angry Birds and it took them 50 or so games to come to come upon Angry Birds. The next thing you know, cultural phenomenon. And, sure. and one of the one of the Gears games in the credits, you know, one of my, my quote is, you know, success is going from failure to failure with a la uh, lack of uh, optimism or, oh, enthousi man, or enthusiasm. Yeah, you know? that hits me. That hits me right here. Well, it's that going back to right the karaoke here. thing. Like, I have yeah. no problem. I have no problem bombing at karaoke. Right. You know, it's just like, you know, like w w on Mondays, you know, I, depending on the song, I have a whole list of songs I want to try to feeling out the crowd. And sometimes I do great. Sometimes I choke, you know, and that's that's life in general. And you have to be, you know, don't be afraid to, to choke a little bit. You know, it's like, you know, we were visiting the family for Christmas in New Orleans, like I said, and there's a karaoke bar in Bourbon called Cat's Meow. And mm. usually at night it's popping. But, uh, you know, for the, for the, you know, for the time being, I'm on the wagon, you know, and, uh, not drinking at all, but karaoke makes you think that you're good and it gives you the courage <laughs> to go up and do it. And I'm like, you know what? It's, it's like, it was like a Tuesday afternoon. It was like four o'clock. There's like a bachelorette party at this karaoke bar. And I'm like, I'm just going to go up and do Billy Idol and see what happens. And I did okay, mm -hmm. but you could tell it wasn't of their generation of music. Right. And so I walked off stage, you know, try, halfway through the song, realizing nobody was feeling what I was singing. And, but I finished the song with, you know, as much enthusiasm as I could muster, walked off the stage and said, well, that's what that feels like. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing when I started my own game studio. I was all bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, thought I could, it was going to take over the world. And, you know, ultimately wound up creating, which actually really bummed me out. And, you know, I was depressed for a good fucking year. Um, and oh, then, God. you know, I've been there. Was, and, and the oh, game was very good. The game was very well received. Yeah, you, you could write an, another book on on the reasons why the studio crumbled and failed. Um, but, sure, you know, sure. Pe people, people act like we, we saw the trailer for Overwatch and we woke up one day and said, in the next 60 days, we're going to clone that entire game. Like that's right, how they think. Right. That's how that's they think. That's not how games work. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really not how it works, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, it turns out, you know, people who liked League of Legends were on both sides of the fence and thought adding abilities and heroes to first person shooters were a good idea. Holy right. shit, we weren't the only ones to have that idea. And next thing you know, the character hero based shooter is a huge thing, right? Yeah. So it, it's the, 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 at the end of the day, the gaming industry is a tough one. It, it speaks. A lot to the fact that, yeah, when I'm making these IPs, I'm willing to put my own money into some of them. But, you know, when it comes to actual investments, I'd rather invest in technology that I think is compelling um, or mm -hmm. Broadway shows or hospitality. Uh, the video game industry is so volatile that those who are responsible the at the big publishers for, you know, uh, holding the purse strings, the bean counters, uh, you know, all of it. Like, I don't I don't envy their jobs because oh. it's like, OK, more Assassin's Creed, more Far Cry, more Call of Duty uh, as opposed to taking a risk on on new thing. And I'm like. You know, if you were a, a big AAA traditional video game publisher, you know, I would have a small studio of, you know, 100 people in each uh, team broken up into 10 different teams of 10 people. Give them a nominal amount of money and say, just prototype some shit. So right. you can come up with from an IP standpoint, from a game mechanic standpoint. It doesn't have to be a hundred million, two hundred million dollar game. It could be a game that ultimately costs uh, the publisher, you know, five, ten million dollars to make, which is, you know, for your layman, a lot of fucking money. But in the grand scheme of game development, not a lot. And they yeah. have their, their next multi billion dollar experience what, on their hands, right? One um one kind of semi unicorn. I would call it like a Barnum and Bailey's unicorn. So it's not a real unicorn. It's more like a sheep with like one horn. <laughs> But but it's still very successful. Is this game called Phasmophobia? Um, have you ever heard of this? Oh one? yeah, my my wife plays that on stream. Yeah, so Phasmophobia is one is one of the highest played VR games in the world. Um, and to your point, it's social, right? Um, it's a shared social experience. Three words, um, but it's also incredibly simple. Like that, you probably could make in six weeks, right? Like 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 at least version one of it. Yeah, and like, you you move at an agonizing speed, which in when you're playing on a PC is is just horrible. But when you're playing in VR, it makes sense because you know reduces nausea, things like that. But it also has the call out to the ghosts and the objectives and things like that. You know, right. sometimes the most dirt simple experience is is all you really really need. And but right. where does that experience comes from? It comes from having a team of ten or less developers that have been funded that they can just say fuck it and make whatever the fuck they want. Going back to the two kids in the garage, you oh, know, that I know, man. when when you have a team of 60, 70, 80, 100, you know, five hundred people. Like, good luck having one voice actually go through the pachinko machine of decision making and getting to the original vision of what was created because it becomes a game of telephone at that point. And that's, yeah. that's why smaller is often better in regards to creation. Yeah. Like, when I started my first game company, um, you know, I, I ju just got out of Rockstar. I got some funding and we had to be like Rockstar. And it was impossible for six guys or eight guys to become like Rockstar. Right. So, we were like, okay, let's do mobile games, right? So we were like on the yeah, right start track. Start small, right? Right, yeah. 
Um, now I just sold Collider, which was one of the biggest like movie entertainment, like media sites out there. And I took all my money and I'm making a friggin' VR game. Like what the hell is wrong with me? But you're, you're spending your own money. <laughs> yeah. Every cent. We, we have zero revenue. We have zero revenue. I'm yeah. like, I'm over here. Like, yeah, I'll spend some money to make a comic book. You're like, fuck it. I'm betting the farm. I'm like, you, you have, you have big, bigger stones than I do, Mark. I'm uh, dude, I, you know, and I also got lucky because I didn't invest in Oculus, but I did buy Bitcoin at $9. Um, you know, so like, I got into that a little bit early, even though I, I refuse to sell it. So it's all this magical made up money that I've made. That's not actual real. Um, yeah, but yeah, dude, I, I, I bought some Bitcoin. I bought some Ethereum and another one. And like, I put it, I was like, fuck it. I'll put a thousand dollars into it. And sometimes <laughs> I check Coinbase and it's like, Oh, you're at like $2. I'm like, well, that was, that was, <laughs> that was compelling. One, one thing for myself, I've learned about, about money. It goes to, for me, at least it goes back to the old adage. Uh, a fool and his money are soon parted. Oh yeah, there it is. One hundred and forty-six dollars and thirty-five cents. Ouch! Ouch! So, so you bought at the top. You bought yeah, at the I, top I, because I that's have, a ninety percent drop. Yeah. So I have, yeah, I have Bitcoin, I have Ethereum, and I have Algorand, whatever the fuck that is. I don't fucking know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I had Tony Scaramucci on the podcast once, and he you had, convinced you had, the, you had the mooch. I had the mooch on, and he convinced me on the podcast to buy some Algorand. <laughs> And um, that's probably sitting at like a few hundred bucks now too. So yeah, um, I just, I diversify and, and, you know, one thing that does resonate though with the, you know, hmm. web three and crypto and all that stuff is one of the lessons I've learned years ago is find an emerging market and write it up. Hmm. You know, back in the nineties, it was shareware, you know, partnering with sure. you know, Tim, Tim Sweeney and Mark Rain. Uh, you know, then it was, you know, first person shooters became a thing. And then, you know, this, that, and the other, and whatever, you know, I would go to the game developer conference. I, I'm surprised we haven't run into each other at those conferences over the years. Um, oh, I mean, I've know. run into you a bunch of times, but uh, like I was never the face of the company, but we've met before because like- uh, God damn it. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> we actually um, have a, a, a mutual friend that we're, uh, um, I'm not sure how close you are with him, but you know, he and I went to war together, uh, Chris Reinhardt. Oh uh, yeah, Reinhardt's Human great. Heads, yeah, yeah, from Human Head Studios. So um, I sold a game to Ubisoft and I picked uh, Human Head Studios to develop the game. Yeah. Um, and it was this beautiful game, incredible game. And Ubisoft completely, like, you know, they gave me $6 million. And then they, and then they shut me down. It's, it's enough for a good prototype. Let's oh, talk. man. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. And they shut me down. But anyway, Reinhardt and I uh, did that game together. And I think a few times at E3, you guys ran into each other. Seemed like you guys were good buddies and you and I met. But it was like... You know how it is at E3, man. It's like, you oh, know, yeah, yeah. Quick. You're, you're either like, hey, how you been? Oh, oh. And if you oh see one party, time, you one time. Ear. So, because, you know, I ran, um, you know, media at Complex. Uh, we did an interview with you once on a bed with a bunch of hot chicks. Do you remember this? Was that in San Francisco? Yes, it was in San Francisco. Yeah, they were, weren't they like penthouse pets or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dude, I just remember that I had totally forgotten about that. Yeah, I think it was I, like some... I, I think mine was one of the least cringe worthy. <laughs> right. I don't know where that idea came from, but the but the editor who ran Ooh, that, I would, I would ran that silo of, for me. I would, I would love to see that hit right now. That oh cool. god, yeah. Anybody yeah, yeah. wants to dig that up and try and use it against me, feel free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we met there too, because like you know, um all right, well, all right. That was at the yeah. cliff, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was at the Clift. It was at yeah. The you Clift. also interviewed what's his name, Dennis Dyack uh, from Silicon Knights, who sued Epic back in the day. And uh, Ooh, Dennis and Dyack, who the hell is that guy? Yeah, he's he he, he did that game. Oh, uh, oh, oh, back then, back then yeah, at, two, uh, for yeah, Complex. Two, yeah, he did Two Human. Um, you know, it, there, there's it. that whole kerfuffle kerfuffle with uh, Epic back in the day, and uh, his interview is a fun one to watch if you can find it. You know, I I, I it was like between two ferns, but if you replace the ferns with hot chicks. <laughs> Hey, the guy pitched it to me and he said, can I have some money to go do this? I was like, yeah, whatever, go, you know, go do it. And look, I'll be honest with you. The reason I funded it is that he told me he had booked you. He told, oh. me, he told me I booked Cliffy. He was down to do it. I was like, if you book Cliffy, you can go ahead and you have the money to do it. And who is who did you guys interview that came out in a fucking bathrobe? Somebody did that. Oh man, I don't remember. I was anyway. there for your interview. Yours is the only one you know that I was there for. And I remember you getting there, uh, shaking hands. Then you went on the bed and you laid down on the bed, and there was these two hot chicks that got next to you. <laughs> Yep, yep. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it wasn't my it's fault. Like, I just greenlit. I think we, we somehow set feminism back a couple steps with that one. <laughs> so, so. 
<laughs> yeah. So look, man, um, we're running late here because you've been very generous with your time. You know, I, um, I could yammer all fucking day long, dude. All right, man. So, you know, just want to make sure that I am sensitive to that. But one thing that I, I, I'd, I'd love to maybe hear a little bit more about is like, you know, you keep mentioning these investments in drama, in, in theater. Um, I believe you have a show called that uh, 80s Club or something uh, regarding the 80s. A <laughs> Hades Town. How did you get to 80s Club? Oh, God, I'm sorry, man. I I, um, I heard one of your interviews and I thought you said 80s Town. It's Hades. Hades Town. Hades, like, like the depths of hell, Hades. Yes, it's based on the old myth of Orpheus and Eurydice and oh, God, Hades. One of my and favorite Hades. sculptures. Oh, Hades and Persephone, um, and uh, it won eight Tonys. Uh, it was uh, created oh, by. Oh wow! And, Congratulations, uh, man. Uh, this oh, it, it's um, it's a really beautiful show. It's still playing over at the Walter Cure in uh, New York, and um, it's it all came out of the fact that uh, there's this um, singer actor named Alex Boinello. He was in uh, Spring Awakening on Broadway. He uh, wound up playing Connor Murphy in Dear Evan Hansen uh, mm. for a while, and he was uh, you know, a fan of my work, and I followed him. Uh, and I became a fan of Dear Evan Hansen. Uh, I'm not going to explain it right now. Those of you who have Google, you can Google it. It's a really, really powerful show. Um, it means a lot to me. My niece is going through a rough patch. My teenage niece, my brother's daughter, a big drama nerd right when my studio was closing and I had to put my dog down. I was one of the hardest times of my life. And uh, that show came along. And then, uh, you know, he reached out to me and said, hey, you know, they're looking for some fresh blood in the investing and producing space on Broadway. We have this upcoming show. And I was like, yeah, I'm in. And so then, you know, wound up being co-producer on that, wound up being in Radio City Music Hall when it won eight Tonys, uh, you know, wow. freshly freshly off of my studio, uh, crumbling in the internet, thinking that was hilarious. So I was like, God, you know what, like, you know what, fuck like you. Me. So Yeah, it's like me a little bit. Like, I'm a video game guy, but I've won, like, Webby's, like, like, over here, I have like six webbies. Just so Mark, people, my your, your, your average gamer, God bless them for some reason, cannot wrap their head around the fact that somebody can make video games, be pretty good at it, and love games and love doing it, but also can like other shit. Right, know, and right. And also get involved in other shit. And like with traditional celebrities, like, you know, like, uh, you know, whatever celeb, you know, 50 Cent invested in fucking vitamin water back in the day, right? Like, you know, yeah. if, if you become, you know, an actual celeb, you know, and you have some money, they start – you know, creating their own production companies, they realize, you know, those who create the stuff are the ones who are, you know, they start doing their own screenplay, start doing direction. Uh, they, you know, they, they, and sadly, that's, you know, often the case for women in Hollywood because they have to, you know, evolve past for some reason the people who cast people in Hollywood. If you're a woman and you're over 30, you're, you're cast as a mom for some stupid reason. Right. So they right. realize, okay, like I need to actually get to the point where I'm the badass. Like you look at Margot Robbie, you know, and she was cast as the great actress who was beautiful. And then she realized I need to become a director and producer and actually control the fucking strings of this shit. And she's crushing sure. it. That's the way it needs to be. But for me, it's like, you know, I have another big Broadway musical that's coming up uh, that I'm going to be co-producer of that I can't say anything about that's coming up soon. And I'm biting my tongue. I can't say anything. Oh, that's um, awesome, man. That's you know, my, well, whenever I do karaoke, one of my favorite little necklaces, it's a shitty little one I got at the State Fair, but it has comedy and tragedy on it. And, uh, uh, you know, whenever I go to Janice. Like, I, well, I go to like a stand-up comedy show or I go to like a Broadway show or any 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 public, you know, I go to karaoke, I wear it because my next tattoo is going to be comedy and tragedy because the arts have always been near and dear to me during the best and the worst parts of my childhood and my adult life. And you can yeah. read about it in the book. Yeah, that's awesome. Control freak. Um, yeah, man, that's awesome because like, first of all, now I don't feel so alone because I've had major success in media and I've been chasing that GTA Vice City buzz since 2001. With yeah. like with like eight games that I've released since then, that none of them have cracked through, you know. But anytime I go do some media crap, it like blows up, you know. So it's like this weird thing about the thing that you're the most passionate at and that you love the most and that you work the hardest at versus what comes easy to you, yeah. you know. And like that's a choice that like you got to be old to almost realize that. You well, know, you got that, you got you got to know, especially as you get a little bit older, and make make no mistake, ageism is definitely a thing in games and technology. Mm. Um, the thing is, is you know, you got to know when to stay in your lane, and you got to know when to just completely do other shit. You know, it's like, you know, yeah, I could be the the I have like six or seven IPs that I've been noodling on, and and none of them are like you know, you know, soldiers in war behind chest high walls taking out evil lizard men. <laughs> you know, I, I have I have the dog IP. I have a uh, something one about gardeners that save the world. Um, I have one about, you know, badass uh, roller girls, uh, things like that. <laughs> um, cool. You know, I have one that's set in New Orleans because uh, I don't know if you've been, but it's one of my favorite. It's honestly one of my favorite American cities besides New York. It's, oh, the old, dude. So you've been. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I went to the uh, 49ers versus Ravens Super Bowl. Was that the uh, one where the power went out? Yeah, yeah. That's the one that me, me and Mike Wilson. I went with yeah. Mike Wilson to that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. it's it's such a great town, and uh, it's one of those things. That there's not enough games set there, and like my my wife's uh, family's from that area, so I go back and visit all the time. And uh, we're going down, going back to Mardi Gras um, uh, in early February, and you know, since I've been drinking for a while, that's going to be my official fall off the wagon. And uh, you know, <laughs> right, right, it, 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 yeah, because yourself. it's got like this great gothic sort of aesthetic. You know, it's like- it, it's got it's got history, it's got architecture, like old school architecture, but also has a lot of in, in industry there. That's, that's the thing about Norco. Norco is this industrial city, mm. kind of near New Orleans, where it's like really these one story uh you know small kind of crummy homes with this industry just everywhere and and it's such a, a town that's at odds with the, it's how devoutly religious it is but also how debaucherous it is and that's why, why i think all the creatives every actor that goes out there to film some shit loves it you know right, right. And, and you know nick cage just did that movie renfield that's going to come out about him being dracula it looks it looks brilliant but yeah you know so that's the thing is i'm you know you know if i remember you know, way back in the day, you know, Mark Rain was friends with, uh, still is friends with Dave Jones, who was the guy from DMA Designs that did the first. Oh, I know two- Davey well. I know Davey very dude. well. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, great dude. Um, and uh, he was working. Disappeared. For- Disappeared. I have no idea where he is. I haven't he, touched base with him he, like well, in four he, years. Yeah, he, he was at Epic for a while. I think he recently re retired back off to Scotland. Um, and he's a great dude. But he, I remember yeah. seeing the first, you know, couple of GTAs, which were top down. And sure, I remember sure. Mark Rain giving me a burnt CD of the music from it. Because remember in the first, first, in the second one, I believe, if you carjack somebody's car, you'd get whatever radio station they were listening to. You know, if you got yeah, a pickup yeah, yeah. truck, it'd be like, my, my, my wife left me and uh, my dog died kind of music, oh, right? And then if you get a mechanic like, that's there to this day. Yeah, if you got like a low rider, you get, you know, hip hop or something, you know, and it's, yeah. it's one of those things, you know, the radio is such an integral part of the GTA experience that, sure. you know, if you want to scratch the GTA itch, you know, go back to, if I were you, I'd go back to the hotline Miami type vibe and go back to the top down view. And as a, because you look at where, you know, Rockstar is going with the future GTA, they're making their own oasis. They're making the ultimate playground where you can do the quest or you can do whatever the fuck you want in the world. And then you add, yeah, in, the yeah. modern, add in the modding community on that, that famous video where the dude took that wedged uh, truck. And then, like, put it in the highway, and then, like, was launching all the. He's going the other way down the highway, launching all the vehicles. That's fucking. That's content gold right there. Uh, yeah, but, you know, the but it's team, not replicated. It's yeah, not replicated. I was. So you know, you're the only one who sees it. That's the problem with it. Yeah. Well, like, if you, the thing is, I go to pitch to a publisher, and they're like, "Well, you, you know, you sci-fi games and blah blah blah." And I'm like, "Don't forget, I made a game about." a fucking rabbit with a gun, you know, back <laughs> right, in the day. Right. Um, you know, like, and you know, my, you look at what's back there, you know, that's my shrine right there to my Australian shepherd that I lost. You know, I love oh, that man. dog so much. The whole fucking thing. I, I still sit there some days and just say hi to him and get misty eyed missing him. But you know, to make a game or an IP or a comic book, that's about a dog. That's a badass. That's something that's just an itch. I want to scratch. And you know, like you look at like a Guillermo del Toro and he's mm-hmm. all usually going to make something in the kind of the creepy slight monster vibe, but sometimes, you know, creatives and, and, developers they can make something that's not necessarily in their wheelhouse and have have you know good traction with it so if you have a good bullshit filter mark i think you know you know keep at it man you know we learned balance by falling as my ex-wife taught me <laughs> I, yeah i learned a lot of balance in that relationship i'm i'm trying i'm trying to make the game um that is empowering to other creatives you know that that's what i'm trying to do with this one you yeah. know like a game that actually lowers the barrier for you to make a game and yeah. look there's been many successes in this space so it's not i'm not reinventing the wheel here or anything but i am trying to do it in a vr context and i'm trying to do it a little bit more towards our kind of generation you were born in 75 i was born in 76 you know we're, we're in the same high school you know um and uh, you know anyway Forget but my you, game. But, but my, if you want some free advice for me, um, the yeah, first yeah, yeah. One, the first one's free, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just it, it goes back to fucking friction points, right? Mm-hmm. Like you look at the amount of steps involved. Like a, you know, there's a Reddit thread recently where a person was saying, you know, I went to do this VR shared experience with my family, and like you know, the the updates I had to install, the amount of buttons I had to click, the the amount of adjustment, the amount of bullshit involved. People want to just plug. And fucking play you know and it goes back to you know you know us being old enough to remember you know when the vcr became a, a, a thing you know your parents get the vcr they plug it in to make sure it worked and then what would you see in the clock 12 12 12 blinking or, or whatever right like yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the clock was too many steps like with every single friction point you lose an exponential amount of people so mm-hmm. you know if, if i could take that fucking headset put it on 
click once or twice and then boom, I'm in a cool environment where I can make like, you know, hey, you like cornhole? Here's my version of cornhole. Oh, you, right. you, wow, you've been busy. You've been in this thing for the last like 60 hours building an actual quest where we can go slay a fucking dragon. Fuck the cornhole. Let's go kill the dragon. Like, you know, that's that's the goal we want to get to, you know, where we're making Amen. our own world. We're making our own, and the, the easiest way you can make it fun and social and imagine, you know, quests that are built with multiple people. You look at the resurgence that D&D has been having in the last 10 years, partially yeah, because yeah. of stranger things, you know, like, a, you know, we even have a, a small store in town called side quest that opened up where people can go rent board games or play them just and you know, buy a few drinks and buy some food and sure. you know, play D and D, you know, and it's like, that's, you know, there's even a new D and D movie coming out. You know, people want to quest, people want escapism now more than ever, especially with this economy and you look at inflation and yeah. all that shit. But yeah, yeah that's, yeah. that's, that's the, that's the free advice. If you, if you want. <clears throat> so look, first of all, thank you for that free advice. It, um, the the friction point thing is very good advice, and it's one that I've heard before in different you know expression but similar message right like you know it people just, call it people it call just it the works. funnel yeah yeah um but yeah first of all I'd be honored if I could get your quest uh, handle name or email that you use I'd love to send you an invite um so you, so you know I can give you a little tour of the game um. And um, yeah, I'll fire that over, dude. Yeah, man, that would be great. But so as we're wrapping up here, one thing that I'd love to get, because my listeners are, are so like, I used to have like the biggest star Wars podcast out there. Really? Um, yeah. Like number one, it's still going on. It's still number one, uh, but I'm not on it anymore because to be honest with you, I, it became me just trashing star Wars and, and, and like, I hated doing that because I love it so much. And I knew that there were people that really were affected by my opinion of Star Wars. I, it sounds so stupid, you know, saying it out loud, but I was a Star Wars guy, right? And yeah. like the new movies turned me off so much that I became kind of like sour oh, grapes. Oh yeah, you, know? you, were, you were that guy. I was that guy, you know? And like, I didn't want to be that guy, you know? Because Star Wars is a beautiful thing. and. Every generation deserves to have their own Star Wars, right? So, well, so okay, so that that could be a whole other podcast. Maybe we'll right, follow. Right? Are you a Star Wars guy? I have a life size R two D two and BB eight downstairs, dude. Like, <laughs> okay. All right, all right. So I, I learned enough. years ago. My the, Star Wars for me is such a big world. You know, you look at and again, they kind of said the extended universe. Screw that. We're gonna we're gonna pick and choose what we want from that. Right. Uh, is it what Dave Filoni or whatnot? Sure. Um, and uh, Arishka or whatever the 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 girl with the um the the orange skin and the the cool kind Ahsoka. of Ahsoka. Ahsoka, yeah, she, you know, and uh, she, her appearance showing up in the latest series was fucking great. Uh, but the thing is, is Star Wars to me is the first three films. Uh, I remember watching the prequels and not liking them. Um, but my brother and I, again, you know, he's three, four years older than I, and so we watched all the movies. The first movie I remember seeing in a drive-in fucking theater is Star Wars, right? Right, right. That's dope. And my brother and I came up with it. We, we came up with the shitty Kenner figures, which had this much articulation. <laughs> oh, right? of course, of course, oh, the were, best. There, Oh, yeah. the, the best and the worst. And uh, <laughs> it's like, look, he has a cape. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> right. right. And and the lightsaber that like had a stick that you would oh, push it out. Oh, yeah. And the trash yeah. compactor is just a bunch <laughs> of leftover packing foam and shit. And uh, step three profit. Uh, but Star Wars for me is the Star Wars that I choose to enjoy and watch. It's like, you mm. know, I actually really loved Andor. I thought it was awesome. I, love I haven't it. seen I, it yet. I haven't. It's 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 very very cool. Um, it shows yeah. the emp the empire is being really fucking evil, which we've all wanted. We've seen yeah. some evil from the empire, but this is like really like next level. Um, but then like you know when it came to like you know the bad bunch or bad batch or whatever, I'm like, no, I'm good. And I see the same thing with like Marvel. You know, like I watch. You know, like I'll go see Endgame and things like that. You know, and I'll yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll like rent the next Doctor Strange. You know, I'll, I'll rent the new Black Panther. There's ones I'll go to theater for. There's ones I won't. Um, sure. And you know, it's the thing. I watched WandaVision, but you know, like in my, my I like watch... WandaVision. I thought that one was very good. Oh, I, it was very subversive in a good way. Yeah. But then you know, yeah. like she she Hulk, I'm like, nah, I'm good. Yeah, um, I'm good on that one too. And um, then there's a lot Loki of culture, was good. culture worship. Loki I skipped also. I'm like, yeah, I'm well, good. Loki you'd enjoy, I think. Loki I thought was very, very it's a it's incredibly well acted, which most Marvel stuff is to be fair, but there's something about the chemistry between Loki and the Owen Wilson character that's actually right. quite magical. Well, that, it, that, that, I mean, that could, that, that kind of reminds me of like, when you look at a lot of people get burnt, those of us, like, you know, you and I, who've, you know, 
every fantasy and sci-fi thing we could gobble up ever since we were kids, right? Sure. And there, there is a point of burnout, which is why, you know, for me, you know, I was kind of burnt out on the superhero tropes in the 90s. And that's when I started reading Preacher. And Preacher really resonated with me, which mm. is why, you know, the, the whole like, you know, I'm not a big fan of Superman. I think Superman's too perfect. I think there's a reason why there hasn't been a really good Superman game to date. Because he's, he's too Reinhardt, fucking Chris Reinhardt used to always talk about that. He's exactly. too, he's too, he's too fucking OP. It's like, okay, yeah, you, yeah, know, you, yeah. you got, you got it's the holy That's grail it. of game design, right? Is designing a good Superman game. And I it did really a documentary is. about uh, telltale games because I was pretty close with Dan Connor and um, the wolf game that they made. Um, wolf among us or wolf something? among us. Yeah. That, that was their whole kind of game design uh, challenge behind it because the wolf and wolf among us is basically Superman. So like creating a game about the guy who can't be beat you know, was kind of like their big challenge there. But anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent. But that, that, that's compelling, but I just, that, that, that's, that was where Dr. Manhattan came from, from Watchmen. That's the whole, like, what do you do when mm. you have this God? Where do you go from there? Sure. Right? And, and you, you know, uh, you like your heroes, but you want them to be fallible. They got to have their, their various sets of weaknesses. You don't want just, it's kryptonite, fuck it, you know? Right. Um, but right. again, he's, he's a character from another era. He's a beloved American institution. Um, and I don't know where we're going. Oh yeah. But the thing is, is burnout, you know? So when you get older, you start picking and choosing the mm. things you choose. I just, I love subversive superhero stuff, which is why I just, I love the boys. I loved it. You know, when I read oh, the God, issues, I love the boys. Man. They're, they're doing a fantastic job of the TV series. And lo and behold, you have, you know, a cultural Amazing. phenomenon, you know, everyone just gets tired of the squeaky, squeaky clean superheroes, which is why, you know, WandaVision, they took this kind of subversive spinoff with the, the, the sitcom format. And they, they made something that kind of got her attention again. And now they're going to have a spinoff with, uh, I can't remember the name of the actress who played uh, Agatha. She, her, she's fucking awesome. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. For, for WandaVision. Yeah. yeah she, the, the Agatha all long song. And she's, she, you know, she's going to yeah. be one of the main witches in the, the coven spinoff. I might watch that, but you know, their life's too short, you know, and I, you know, when or, I go downstairs to watch something, so we're going to watch horror. We're going to watch something simple. We're going to watch comedy. You know, what, yeah. what's it going to be? There's just too much entertainment out there, dude. Now, now we're all over the place here, but I gotta ask, <laughs> uh, what about what do you think about the Joker going musical? Because like the uh, last is, Joker was masterful in my opinion, but yeah, is that confirmed? I think it is. I mean, it's so fucking. I'm weird. not it sure. Might, I'm not it's, sure. It's, it's so fucking weird. It might work in some level, you know. Um, like, but, it could probably work great if he's in the asylum and he's losing his mind and it's but all that, musical. That, but, but I mean, that's why when they were talking about, uh, you know, uh, God doing a first person Metroid game back in the day when Metroid Prime was, you know, being, mm, you know, had point. the buzz. I was like, that's bullshit. I never want a first person Metroid game. That'll never right. work. It doesn't work until it works. And then everybody's <laughs> right. like, and then oh my God, quite good. The next Fast and the Furious needs to be a musical. Actually, oh, that, Matt. That could be so fun, actually. One thing I got to share with you, Cliff. Um, so like one of my little pet projects last year was to build the ultimate arcade machine, right? Like, oh, yeah. like for, for like my, or... yeah, yeah. It, it's basically, I'm using something called coin ops. I've, I, you know, you know, it's kind of like a little hobby, right? So I, you know, like I've tried uh, retro arc, I've tried them all, right? Like, you know, all kinds of raspberry pies, PCs, you know, everything. Oh, yeah. But anyway, bottom line is I, I played with one of my buddies, um, double dragon. Oh, and yeah. I had always heard of this game, but I had never really played through it, right? And we played through it, and I'm I'm playing it, and it's this amazing co-op game. And I think it's the first game where enemies drop uh, weapons that you can yeah, then the, equip. The, the pipe and the baseball bat and all that. Yeah, which is, you know, I was, like, blown away by that. But then the most mind-blowing game mechanic that I think I've ever seen happened, which is that you're playing co-op all the way until the final boss battle, which is each other. Yep. And, and like, I never knew that existed. You know, yeah. it's like this mastery of video game I, there, design. There, there, there's a tweet that happened a while back, and it's actually a funny thing because um, I heard the, somebody's working on the history of the game Karatika, uh, uh, Jordan Metzner's game that was big before he did uh, Prince of Persia and whatnot. Yeah, and yeah, that was yeah. That was one of those games I remember playing that on the Apple II with my older brother. And I remember, you know, playing through all the puzzles and everything and getting to the end and you had to rescue the princess and you had two modes in that game. You had standard kind of like, you know, walk around, do, 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 and then you had combat mode. And if you right. approach, if you, if you remember, if you approach the princess while you're in combat mode, she'd kill you. And then boom, game over. And that's one of those great little like classic things like Psycho Mantis, you know, move the, the controller port over and things like that. That's, yeah. that's, that's subversive game design at, at its best. But also I think, you, you know, you're rescuing the girl in Double Dragon always. It was always rescue the princess because it's fucking easy. Same reason right, right. so, so many games are shooters because it's easier than doing something else, you know? But, um, but, but yeah, like, the fact that we're going to fight over the girl and whoever beats the other dude up gets yeah. the girl. I'm like, oh, real caveman mentality there. You know, dude. it's just like, like, I don't know how that, 
look, I'm a game freak. I've been working in the game industry for decades. I, I had no idea how that wasn't spoiled for me. And you will that find my... that you, you'll be astonished the older you get, the more you find the, the little shit that slipped under the radar of stuff you never, right. you never heard, never even heard of or played. And that still happens to me to this day. So don't feel bad about it. But I mean, it's an amazing discovery that I think somebody should leverage it in any sort of, Oh man, I got to use it now. You know, like, um, you know, so my podcast was called rule of two and, um, in my game, I have lightsabers and stuff. You know, we call them whatever. I, I can't believe I said that out loud because not glow, this is evidence. Glow, glow sticks. Yeah, <laughs> glow sticks. But the rule of two is always about the master and the apprentice, right? So that's kind of like my little spin on Double Dragon is that, you know, you have a master and an apprentice as roles in this co-op RPG. And then at the end, the apprentice needs to see if he can take out the master, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, so, it, but but like such a beautiful, elegant the circle game. is complete. Yeah, yeah, and it's like that's really why I have that arcade system is that there's game mechanics that have been lost to time that are just absolutely incredible. That's that's you know? actually really, that's really fucking smart of you because that's that's one of my MOs. Like, you know, like mm. when we did the Gears games, we saw that game Kill Switch and, and win back back in the day. We're like, mm. that's a good idea. It wasn't really done that well. What if we did that with the next generation engine and like great universe and, and it, it was compelling and then boom step three profit grand theft auto winds up having covered it for fuck's sake um and there <laughs> there's so many other little games one of the ones i always reference is that game breakdown it was an xbox game where you had mm. you had guns but then melee and there were these big kind of anime looking dudes who were all like white and glowy skin was glowing and shit and they, they were impervious to bullets and you had to swap and actually Isn't go to that Davy jones's game i think that's Davy jones's game i have no idea uh i thought, yeah, it, was yeah, yeah. I thought it was a japanese development hold on team. What was Davy Jones's? I Dave did. Dave, Dave, well, Dave did Lemmings first. Lemmings is what made him. You know, right, right. Lemmings, the GTA, but I think Breakdown is his. I think I Breakdown even, is his. He did a bunch of games in the N64 too. Hold on, let me look this up. I don't have a. Uh, uh, just give me one second. There is like Blast Core. There is one where the the whole goal was just to destroy things. There was one where there was aliens. Oh uh, no, it's not that one. It's not that one. Okay. It's not that one. All right, so anyway, so the, the whole idea is, and that's that's really smart of you to do, is there's so many old school game mechanics like that that you can take. You, and I always used to make the comparison in interviews. When you look at Grand Theft Auto, the old the, the 2D ones, top down, one and two, mm -hmm. you know, the player was, the, you know, the, the criminal and the, the, co the ghosts were essentially the cops and the pedestrians you were running over were the, the dots, right? Right, right, right. And so it's, you know, everything is the same thing, just sometimes reskinned. It's just a matter of, of hiding. And the other one that I want to I want to sometimes go back to and revisit. First of all, I've never heard that one before, and you're absolutely right. Well, it goes, G yeah, GTA, GTA is Pac-Man. First of all, you have no idea how many hours I spent in that office, how many times I slept in that in that office. I had not, I've never heard that one before, and that's a good one. Oh, it pleases, is like G yeah. pleases me to be the first. Um, but, you know, it goes back to, you know, I think you look at PlayStation 1 and the game Jumping Flash, where you're like this robotic rabbit shooting in first person, and they made first person platforming fun before it was even a thing. Uh, right. I re recently played this game called, uh, I think it was uh, Neon White or something like that. And it was a first person platformer. Uh, and it was really, really solid, you know, kind of like Mirror's Edge, but simplified. And that's mm. the kind of stuff I like these days. And so if going back to full circle, the top of the conversation, yeah. um, I were to, you know, participate and work in the video game industry, if it would have me, because, you know, for everybody that seems to like my work, there's some people out there that hate me really, really, really? bad. It's Is weird. Is that out I there? It's still out there. It's weird. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see, but it would have to be in my own terms. But, you know, I just I want to make cool new stuff. And if somebody wants to, you know, hit me up, uh, I'm, I'm all ears at this point. Right, right. What What's your relationship like, if you don't mind me asking, with Tim Sweeney? Uh, I mean, I could email him tomorrow and, you know, right, have right, a chat. Right. You know, I could go to lunch with him, you know, and I still go to, you know, Hurricanes games uh, with Mark Rain once in a while. Uh, right, you know, right. so I'm, st I'm still friendly with them. You know, they all read the book and they thought it was fine. Um, that was that was one of the big things about the book, by the way, was like, am I going to be able to get away with this like legally? Because I'm under like I still have an ironclad NDA with Epic. Um, of course. But, you know, the whole thing about the book was it was just my personal journey through the video game industry as I grew up, as the video game industry grew up. And, you know, I we vetted everything legally. So I think it ultimately is clear and cool. But, you know, there's people out there that, you know, may want to talk to me or may not, you know, but I just I want to make stuff. You know, I literally have the tattoo that I got a couple of years ago on my left arm, which is Harold and the purple crayon that mm. says create, you know, cause I'm a lefty to remind me that if I'm not creating stuff, then I, I don't feel that I have value. And so I, I, just, I like, I like making shit, man. It's at the end and, of the day. and do you feel um, that Tim was like a mentor to you? And do you feel the responsibility to mentor others? Oh, Tim was very much a, a mentor and to some extent a father figure. So was, you know, Mark Rain. And that goes back to the fact that I lost my dad when I was 15 years old. I mm. barely had the college experience and, you know, I was always very, very young for my age. Um, and so when it comes to mentoring other people, you know, if I see some, a game that I think looks cool 
and I follow the person on social media, you know, and they ever, you know, want to give me an early build and, you know, I'll just, I'll give them feedback. I don't mind, you know, I mean, there could be, you know, if you want me to like consult it all for a couple bucks, I'll do that too. Um, right, right, right. You know, like I, I recently saw a video for, um, I can't remember the atomic heart, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, it's this FPS coming out of, I think so there it's being developed in Eastern Europe, I believe. And it looks kind of like this mashup of like uh, crisis meets Bioshock vibe. Mm -hmm. uh, you're this soldier in this area where the robots have taken over. And I was watching a video of it and it looked beautiful, but I was watching just a lot of little things. Uh, yeah, like there's so many little fixes they could have done in that game to give it so much more feedback for combat. Like I'm shooting these enemies that have a million hit points. And I'm barely seeing any damage in the enemies. I'm barely seeing any sparks or, or right. feedback for my shots. The guns don't sound very good. Like they had like one of those raise the enemies up and drop them kind of attacks. And the enemies just kind of went, right, like, dude. Right. You know, they should drop, they should break open, the, the the ground should shake, there should be dust particles coming up, like, hello, like, and right. I, I, I don't know, it's just one of those things, like, there's a lot of little things in video game design that people miss, and that, that was, you know, part of my job for 25 years was to to play spot the difference in things that were broken or weren't as fun as they could be. So, look, now I'm being abusive, we're, we're, we're an hour and 20 minutes in, but I got to ask you this, because it's, it's, as the CEO of my company, it's the thing that... I find myself doing the most and struggling with the most, but knowing is the most important thing. You as a former uh, entrepreneur, um, you still are an entrepreneur, but as somebody who owned the big development studio, what's your philosophy like for recruiting people? God, that's a, that could be another TED talk. Um, I mean, <laughs> right. all that, that. Your, your, your company's culture starts at the top. Mm. Um, and there's so many different things, how you present yourself on the website, um, you know, the, the type of people that you want to attract, uh, you want people that are passionate, uh, that care about what you're making, um, you know, and they have to, they, the sad truth of the matter is they have to be willing to work hard. You know, I think crunch time is a hotly debated topic in the video game industry. I think sure. you, it's, it, it often is inevitable, but I think you can mitigate that through proper planning uh, and good management, but the, the good luck finding that. Um, mm. And just ultimately, you know, get the word out about your studio and, and attract the right people and make sure they work well together. We had a great crew at boss key but still you know some bullshit wound up creeping in there you know and it's part of its human nature you know could i have been a better ceo absolutely i was an average ceo at best um and that the thing was is you know I was, i'm a creative you know i'm not used to like you know hiring people is fun firing is like the worst fucking thing in the world and you know the only thing worse than getting fired is being or the only thing worse than firing somebody is being the person getting fired sure um, sure you, you never want to do that and, you know, I'm, I guess, you know, the best way to be a good CEO is to be a sociopath is what I firmly believe in my heart of hearts. But, yeah. You know, yeah. Well, you, you, you're definitely on the, uh, on the spectrum, as they say, uh, of sociopathic behavior, which is a good thing, you know, and a compliment. You're, um, you're in a desert. There's a tortoise on its back. <laughs> it, the hot summer sun is baking on it. What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, look, what I'm going to do is see, um, do, do you still keep in contact with any of your unreal developers, man? Because I, I, I mean, I'm always looking, you know, I need more developers, you know, it's like, that's the one thing that for some reason, unity became so ubiquitous in the sort of like, you know, independent gaming space yeah. that, you know, it's impossible to find on real developers. I've had to send people to university to learn C++. That's weird because I was under, I was under the impression that Unreal was the one that had largely taken over in that space because I keep no because you live because you live in friggin' North Carolina like, like I still have the I still have the internet Mark <laughs> right. no so look my experience look every single game VR chat you know Rec Room uh, Neos VR Chill Out VR all the games Unity. in my space all Unity yeah. right. Like all the kids know what what C sharp is. Oh, it sounds they, like it sounds like something my former employer may want to uh, might want to work on. Please, because I need like you know we need more volume of developers. But my thesis is is that all the big studios that are using Unreal are you know buying up all the C plus plus people. And, you know, uh, just making it very difficult for guys like me to hire. Yeah, like a talent dream. But, I mean, you know, my gut says if a person is smart enough to learn Unity or 3D Studio Max or Photoshop or any 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 of these tools, they're smart enough to learn the Unreal Engine. I I, I, I mean, there's a lot in there, but, uh, right. you know, it's, it's you know, a smart person can learn a different, you know, app. It's, it's yeah. if, if they can learn the first one, they can learn the other one. You know, if you, if you can learn to drive this car, you can learn to drive that car. You know, it's not that different. Yeah. Well, Clifford, man, it's been an absolute joy. I feel like we're kindred spirits, even though, you know, we've met before, we've never connected. And I feel like I actually finally got to connect with you, man. And well, I, well, I'm well, well, we'll always have that hotel room in those random attractive. <laughs> yeah. 
I wonder, wonder where those. Forget. I wonder where those ladies are today. Yeah. So, like, think about that moment where you were on the bed with the two women, and then look off to your left, and there was like a door right here, like in the room. I was standing there looking at it, like I can't believe. Oh, this. you were the one with his dick out. That's right. <laughs> Just always, always, always. He, he had he had yeah. hit the catering card. It was a banana. <laughs> right, right. Anyway, dude, thank you so much for having oh, me. Oh man, dude. thank you so much. The book is Control Freak. Um, go check it out. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon and Kindle it. I mean, I haven't had a physical book in years, but it's on know. Audible, Audible as well. Oh, oh, really? Who read it? Uh, is this a, a guy who's done a million books before? I can't remember his name. Uh, is it was an Asian name, but I, I, he deserves more credit than that because he did a fantastic job. Um, That's cool. I couldn't do it myself because it's my entire life story, and I'd probably be crying at three points in it. Sure. So, plus, I got a surprising a lot of a lot of things going on. You know, I got to get to karaoke, man. You know. So. Did, did you hear the whole audiobook? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it was uh, it was really weird hearing my own voice through someone else. Uh, so wow that's amazing man that's a pretty meta but he experience. again he did a, he did a great job with it so you know that's some, cool, some people are auditory learners some are visual learners uh, but i just you know it's my my journey you know growing up as the business grew up so i hope people dig it cool man it was an honor to speak with you hopefully we'll be able to connect again soon clifford yeah man i'll drop a line about the uh, oculus uh handle and whatnot and uh i'll be in touch dude good seeing All you right. thank you man cheers All right.